Thank you very much, Kiara. It was great to see Hal, a good friend of mine, uh, just now. And uh, I'll start with where, where Hal ended with that, uh, um, just voicing my thanks to you and to the uh, Italian Buddhist Union for this invitation. It's really quite a program you've put together. I'm really quite impressed, actually, as Hal was too. Great to be here in this on this panel with some really outstanding uh, scholars and friends too, actually. So uh, I'm really looking forward to uh, hearing the, the rest of the talks and hopefully uh, my talk will hold up to some extent. Uh, I'm gonna be talking uh, about what Buddhist, what do we mean by Buddhist science? How do we make sense of Buddhist science? And that's th this idea of sense making is actually going to be uh, important here. It's going to be, I'm going to be drawing a little bit on the notion of how in a sense we produce meaning or really how our sense of who we are, both as individuals and as a culture or society, is completely interpenetrated by, is completely interdependent upon the world. In a sense, self and world, or we even, not just self, but all, ourselves as a, as a culture or society, are mutually implicated in the construction of our world, such that world and self or world and culture actually are in some ways actually completely dependent producing each other, if you like. But I'll begin by thinking about, well, what, where is this term Buddhist science? You know, what, was, what does it mean now? And uh, I'm going to just hold up a book here. I think you'll be able to see it. This is the second volume in a series called Science and Philosophy in the Indian Buddhist Classics. And I had the pleasure of working on this volume. This second volume is on the mind. The first volume was on uh, the uh, physical world. And it comes from a series of volumes that were sponsored by His Holiness the Dalai Lama, uh, originally in Tibetan, in Tibetan called the Tsen and Kundu, and that were produced over the last few years and then have been translated into English and actually several other uh, languages as well. And this project, in some ways, I think, came out of His Holiness's long-term interest, as many of us know, uh, especially those of us who have been involved with the Mind and Life Institute, his long-term interest in science, the many dialogues that he's engaged in uh, with scientists. But also it comes from something, a, a tripartite division that His Holiness uh, crafted, I think probably starting around 2010. And I'm, I'm thinking of a meeting that we were holding on ecology, ethics, and interdependence that Dan Goldman and I helped to chair for the Mind and Life Institute in Dharamsala, India, a week-long conference. And I recall during that conference, because of the emphasis on ethics, actually, that part of what emerged was this tripartite division. So it may be, maybe then it could be earlier that His Holiness uh, crafted this division. But in any case, it is something really quite new in, in, in the Buddhist world. The idea that there is, first of all, what His Holiness calls in Tibetan, Nangbe Chö, which he literally means uh, um, uh, Buddhist or really the insider. So the term for Buddhism here means insider, interestingly enough. So the uh, Buddhist Dharma, which we translate, gets translated as Buddhist religion, Nangbe Taudrup, Buddhist philosophy, and then Nangbe Sendrik, uh, Buddhist science. And interestingly here, His Holiness does not choose to use a term, uh, a, a classical uh, uh, Buddhist term to talk about science. There are some terms like the term Rigpa, ra, uh, Rigpa, Rigpa in Tibetan, uh, in Sanskrit, Vidya, which refer to different types of what might be called sciences. And these would include medicine, that actually also include, include uh, the, the sciences involved with the arts, uh, they'd, they'd include uh, architecture. They'd also include reasoning, for example, the science of how reason works. So these would be different kinds of sciences. And there is a term for that and even a, a tradition and a literature about these kinds of sciences. But the term that His Holiness uses is a neologism, a newly created term, which is this term Tsendrik. So in many ways, by creating that threefold division, His Holiness the Dalai Lama is really pointing to something that is deliberately new. And we need to ask, well, what are the motivations, in a sense, for, for doing this? Why would we make this division? Many of you are probably familiar with the literature, for example, by Donald Lopez, on this idea of Buddhism as scientific. And some of the most recent work is actually done by Evan Thompson, in his book, Why, I'm, Why I Am Not a Buddhist, which is a good read, a book I, I, I'll refer to a little bit and that I disagree with on certain points, but that overall has made some excellent points that we'll be coming back to. And 
one of the claims here is that Buddhism has, in a sense, been scientized since the 19th century as Buddhist cultures, especially actually in uh, Sri Lanka, for example, encountered co uh, the colonial uh, forces of the West as they were in, in some ways trying to resist these colonial forces. They tried to create an image of Buddhism as being, in a sense, more scientific than Western religions. And so the scientization of Buddhism was re really driven by a kind of anti-colonial political strategy. That, I think, is probably a bit of an exaggeration to say that everything that we might see as being somewhat scientific of, uh, about Buddhism is simply the result of a kind of, I don't know, Buddhist propaganda starting in the 19th century. That doesn't seem too likely to me. Uh, and we'll explore some features of Buddhism that actually really do seem to go very far back in Buddhist history, but also that might, might in some ways constitute something that could be called science, if you like. So that's one, but that motivation, on the other hand, is actually a, not only, I think, one that we can historically identify, that is to say that in a certain way, this is Buddhism presenting itself to the modern world in a positive light, but it's also something that His Holiness also has acknowledged, that there is an importance to, uh, in a sense, pointing out how Tibetan culture specifically does have some very powerful ways of looking at human existence, of understanding our world, of making sense of our world, that have features that in some ways resemble modern science, and that also can really contribute to the understanding of our world and ourselves that modern science is trying to also engage with. So in that way, that motivation, I don't think we should just say it's either completely about trying to present a kind of, you know, scientized Buddhism or else it's just a sheer fabrication. I think it's somewhere in between these, that this is a, a, a motivation that we have for talking about Buddhist science that is, excuse me, is not inappropriate. But it also, if we emphasize that too much, then we lose something about what, what His Holiness is trying to point to in the Buddhist tradition. And this then raises the question as well, <laughs> what is science? And that is not an easy question to answer. Uh, anyone, any philosopher of science, and I would not claim to be either a philosopher of science or a historian of science, but any philosopher or historian of science would readily tell you that this is a, the, ask, asking the question, what is science, is almost like answer, asking the question, what is religion? So my own original PhD is in religion. And one of the jokes you could say among us who, uh, who are religionists, who are scholars of religion, is that most of us have no idea what religion is. If you ask us, what is religion? We really can't tell you. It's uh, not an easy question to answer. Likewise, what is science? I think philosophers of science and historians of science will say, well, you know, it sort of depends on who you ask. Nevertheless, we can make some sense of this term by thinking about it in terms of being a knowledge system, a system that is to say, so in general, there are many different kinds of knowledge systems. When His Holiness separates religion, philosophy, and science in a way that is very modernist, that is really pointing to a kind of uh, assumption in the West about the distinction between religion and science, he's also pointing to different styles of knowledge systems. So a knowledge system is just a way of making sense of the world again, of our location in the world and how we understand it together. Uh, a knowledge system runs by certain kinds of rules. It exhibits what uh, Ian Hacking calls a style of reasoning. Uh, in other words, a style of reasoning is basically within a knowledge system, what enables that knowledge system to bring up issues as being worthy of examination, first of all, and secondly, though it's what enables us to say whether or not a particular claim is a candidate for being true or false. Let me just repeat that because it's a little bit subtle. So a knowledge, when we talk about a style of reasoning in a knowledge system, a in a particular style of reasoning, something is a candidate for being true or false. A claim, a statement is a candidate for being true or false as a result of that style of reasoning. So, for example, the claim, uh, I don't know, the Buddha is omniscient is, is something that makes a lot of sense in the style of reasoning that is Buddhist religion, so to speak, right? Nang Bei Chu, as uh, His Holiness refers to it, the Buddha Dharma. But it probably is not uh, a claim that is even a candidate for examination, a candidate for being true or false in, let's say, modern science.
So a style of reasoning already, in a way, places certain types of constraints on knowledge systems. And that style of reasoning, as we will see, is going to be deeply connected to our values, actually. So a knowledge system in and of itself is not science, right? Well, that's certainly not what His Holiness is trying to point to when he talks about science. Instead, I think His Holiness is trying to point to a certain style of reasoning that comes out of what he calls the Nalanda tradition. And the Nalanda tradition, Nalanda was a great monastery uh, in, in ancient India, a very important seat of Buddhist learning. And, uh, and the ruins of this monastery are, are located in present day Bihar in uh, modern India. And uh, within Nalanda, there were many different topics uh, of study. But in particular, His Holiness is pointing to the literature, and when we refer to this volume here that I showed you earlier, really the main sources for Buddhist science are primarily going to be the Abhidharma tradition, which many of you are probably familiar with, uh, also in Pali known as the Abhidharma tradition, and then also the Pramana or epistemological tradition. So when we think of this in the context of Tibetan Buddhism, Abhidharma tradition, we usually think of the philosophers uh, Asanga and Vasubandhu, who are uh, active in the early part of the first millennium. And then uh, for the Pramana tradition, the tradition of epistemology, we think of Dignaga and Dharmakirti, uh, starting around the fourth to fifth century with Dharmakirti maybe in the seventh century. So these are kind of two streams of uh, two knowledge systems, really, that get combined within their initially somewhat separate, but they eventually become quite combined in the Buddhist traditions. And this is the source, you could say, within that whole Nalanda tradition, these two streams of Abhidharma and the Pramana or epistemological tradition are really the core sources for what His Holiness is referring to as Buddhist science. And one of the things that's really interesting about these traditions is the way in which they emphasize the empirical. So this is going to be a key feature. And, and some modern theorists like Vaz, um, Baz von Frossen in his book, The Empirical Stance, will also uh, emphasize the notion that whatever else we mean by science, it's certainly, we certainly mean that it is empirical. And this is something that seems to be quite unique to the Buddhist tradition. Uh, Evan Thompson, my friend and the author of uh, Why I Am Not a Buddhist, uh, doesn't uh, quite agree with me on this, but I would uh, I, I disagree with Evan. I think this is actually really something that is unique in the Buddhist tradition. What I'm referring to here is a certain kind of very thoroughgoing, thoroughgoing empiricism, a very strong emphasis on the empirical. Now, what does that mean exactly? Well, si simply put, especially in the context of ancient India, where these authors were writing, one of the main sources of knowledge, so we have a knowledge system, we have sources in a sense of knowledge, we have like, you could say data that we're receiving, and then we have ways of interpreting that data so as to come to some kind of a conclusion, uh, some kind of assessment of a situation, whatever it might be. And one of the main sources of uh, data, you could say, for uh, classical Indian knowledge traditions were uh, scriptures. And interestingly, this was actually quite uh, common across multiple different knowledge systems in ancient India, but the uh, especially the Buddhist epistemological tradition in the work of uh, the philosopher Dharmakirti very strongly sets aside the importance of scripture. And actually to the point that what Dharmakirti says is, uh, for example, we can think of the Noble's Four Truths, right? The truth of suffering, the truth of origin, the truth of cessation, and the truth of the path. Dharmakirti argues that we can actually establish these through our own experience, through the evidence of the senses. That is to say, we can establish these through what we can directly perceive, but then also, importantly, through what we can infer based upon our perceptions. So we have on the one hand a, a direct perception, and on the other hand, what we can infer based upon our perceptions. And that those two means of knowledge are what enable us to, for Dharmakirti, establish, for example, the, the Four Noble Truths. Uh, on, so, so he says, we do not need a, another form of inference, another uh, uh, source of knowledge, which is scripture, according to Dharmakirti, in order to prove the Noble's Truths. But Dharmakirti goes even further, and he says, not only do we uh, not need scripture, actually, scripture 
or the words of the Buddha, in fact, do not prove anything. So this is really quite a strong statement, and subsequent commentators don't really seem to accept it fully. But some of them do, but some of them don't, uh, perhaps especially in Tibet. But Dharmakirti and his earliest commentators very clearly say the Buddha's words don't prove anything because words have no necessary relationship to reality. If we're trying to establish that something is the case, especially something that is important for us to achieve our goals, then what we need to rely upon are our perceptions and the interpretation of our perceptions through inference, through carefully constructed inference. And that is basically what is meant by the empirical in Dharmakirti's context. And when we think about the history of science, one of the ways of thinking about how science emerges is in somewhat similar ways in the West, that is to say, Western science, European science, is that also in a certain way of trying to move away from an authority that is rooted in something other than the empirical, something other than the evidence of the senses. Now, what this might suggest to you at this point is, well, empiricism means whatever I perceive, if I just directly perceive it, then that establishes it. Uh, you, this could even be reinforced by the a particular feature of Dharmakirti's, um, of the whole epistemological tradition, but especially Dharmakirti's model, which is the idea that perception, for example, visual perception, is in fact a kind of direct apprehension. It is, uh, um, it is not conditioned by concepts. In other words, it is what we call a non-conceptual. So we have a kind of direct apprehension of something, and that direct apprehension is giving us, through a causal process, is giving us, in a sense, direct data about that thing. So that sounds like, well, whatever I see or experience, just my own experience, for example, my experience of my own mind, from a first-person standpoint, like uh, Hal Roth was talking about, that that experience is just given as true because I feel it or I see it or I experience it. And so in a certain way, it might sound like my own experiences, my first person experiences, for example, of my own mind, that somehow that establishes something definitively in a way that is indubitable and can't be denied. And that would be a misreading of Dharmakirti's epistemology. Because very importantly, what Dharmakirti says, and this is part of this idea of, of what, what makes a Buddhist science as being empirical, what Dharmakirti says is, yes, we do have a kind of direct apprehension through our senses of whatever is available to the senses. However, a couple of things. One of them is those senses are occurring within a particular kind of embodiment. And that particular kind of embodiment is going to affect the way in which the world looks to us. So that's one issue that we'll come back to. But a second issue that's perhaps even more crucial is that that sensory data that is, in as much as it's non-conceptual, it's actually not interpreted. So simply what I feel or what I experience is not something that I can act on. In a certain way, it's not really something that has a truth value. It's not true or false. It's simply that raw data. It needs to be interpreted in a particular conceptual system. And so one way of thinking about what Dharmakirti is talking about here is that even our own experiences can suggest to us interpretations that are wrong. So a common example in the Buddhist world would be our sense of having a kind of unchanging self our sense of being the one that is experiencing, our sense of being the one that is talking, that is listening, uh, that would seem to be given in our, in our perception, in our experience from our first person standpoint. But Dharmakirti will say, no, that is not correct. That is not actually happening in the way it seems to be happening. We can know that by carefully examining what is happening in our experience, but in order to do that, we have to engage in a rational, inferential process, a process of examining through reason, through reason, using inferences, of examining what is actually happening in our experience. So again, raw perception does not enable us to act on that perception. We have to interpret it. And our perceptions can give to us impressions that suggest one interpretation at a naive level, level, but actually they are wrong. So given that, one other feature that's really going to be crucial 
for this style of reasoning is the idea that in some sense, this process of examining our experience through reason, through analysis, that that process is actually public. And here I'm uh, thinking of uh, um, the work of uh, Jonathan Canary uh, and also someone that he cites, the historian Philip Kitcher, the idea that in some sense science is kind of about a public process, a public process in which there is in principle uh, uh, a kind of even ground of authority. Now, in reality, of course, science, like uh, any other human institution, is not quite uh, as simple as its ideal form would suggest. But the point here is that what is meant to uh, constitute a claim in a scientific context is a claim that has been uh, run through the mill, if you like, of public discourse, of public examination. In, uh, in, in, you know, in current times, we do that through, for example, the peer review process. We also do it through education, actually, where we are educated into the knowledge system of modern science. And so, too, in the Buddhist context, this is also the case. My assertions about the nature of my experience, for example, maybe that there isn't a single controlling self in here, a single controlling perceiver in here, somewhere in here, a true absolute I, so to speak, that that claim is not one that I, I, if I come to some form of reasoning, it's not one that will hold up if that reasoning only makes sense to me. That reasoning has to make sense in a public context. In other words, that reasoning in, in some sense is one that I have to share, but also that I learn. I learn the categories, the concepts, and even the process of inferential reasoning within a particular kind of knowledge community. So that kind of science that Buddhism is talking about here is a science that is, on the one hand, very empirical, Right? It's moving, moving away from any claim that authority lies in scripture or testimony. You know, it's true because, I don't know, my lama said it. Well, that's not going to work in this context at all. Yeah, it's true because the Buddha said it in the scripture. No, that's not going to work in this context. What we, if we're going to come to some sense of something being true, which is a bit problematic as a term, but we'll keep it for now. If we're going to come to some sense of, of, of something being true, then it's true because based upon my perceptions and the interpretation of my perceptions, the accurate, correct interpretation of my perceptions, I can conclude that it's true in a way that is public, that others can also share. So these are the two features. This, that is, on the one hand, it's, it's empirical, and on the other hand, that there's a kind of public process uh, that enables us to take that empirical data and interpret it. Now, when we think about these, so uh, this so far, I think is uh, my understanding of what His Holiness the Dalai Lama is talking about when he says that uh, in when he's referring to Buddhist science and especially Buddhist science as emerging out of the Nalanda tradition, especially the Abhidharma and the epistemological tradition. When we look at some features of Buddhist science and ask ourselves, well, how is this? And, and you know, okay, maybe that in some ways this this. Uh, shares some features that are similar to what we think of as science now. Modern science seems to be uh, high, it certainly claims to be empirical. It certainly claims to have a kind of public process uh, for uh, uh, coming to conclusions that are accepted by the community. Uh, but there are certain features of Buddhist science that actually challenge modern science. And I think this is another reason why it's useful to use this term Buddhist science. I would just to take a, a step back for a second, I want to point out that there is a literature, a growing literature on what's called ethnoscience or sometimes indigenous science. Uh, in other words, a literature that examines the way in which indigenous peoples, for example, uh, encounter their own environments, make sense of those environments in ways that uh, produce knowledge that is uh, actionable, that is useful knowledge, that in sometimes is actually more useful in a scientific account because maybe, for example, it's more compatible with its environment. Um, be that as it may, I think there are certain parallels between the use of the term Buddhist science and some of what's happening in ethnoscience. But the Buddhist, but when we when we use the term this term Buddhist science again as a modern term, a new term, trying to extract certain features out of the Buddhist tradition, there are kinds of features that are, I would say, unique to uh, the to Buddhist science, and that also pose certain types of challenges to contemporary science, challenges that I believe are useful. So one of these is the way in which Buddhist science is highly context sensitive. 
So what I mean by that is, and there, let's talk about two different ways in which Buddhist science is context sensitive. One of them we've already referred to briefly, which is the notion that as what if Buddhist science is very empirical, I'm working with the evidence of the senses, I'm receiving in a sense, uh, uh, receiving as too passive a term, I'm engaging with the world in a way that produces sense impressions that are interpreted. That's the basic model here. Those sense impressions, however, are really contingent on not just my own assumptions, those do affect my senses. So this is what in contemporary philosophy is sometimes called cognitive penetration. That is to say, what I'm looking for, what I believe to be the case, can actually have an impact upon those sense impressions, even though those sense impressions are not themselves conceptual. So that's one. You could put it another very simple way. If I'm a scientist uh, and, and I'm engaged in research and I'm trying to use the evidence of the senses, whether it's the senses directly or the senses extended by some kind of a mechanism like an fMRI, uh, when I'm doing that, I'm looking for certain kinds of things. I'm interested in certain kinds of things. And what I'm not interested in, I'm just not going to pay any attention to. So uh, this is a, a phenomenon that we sometimes call inattentional blindness, where I just literally don't even see something that's right in front of me because I don't care about it. It's not important to me. So that's one way, that's very important key way in which you could say that Buddha, Buddha science is pointing to the context sensitivity of this way of approaching knowledge. That, in other words, it's very sensitive to what our interests are, what kind of a conceptual system we're using, even what kind of a language we're using. So our immediate sense impressions, even though they are not themselves linguistic or conceptual, are still conditioned by that. But then secondly, at an even deeper level, our sense impressions are conditioned also by our very embodiment. And this is, you know, one of the ways that this is expressed in, the, uh, in classical Buddhist texts. As some of you may know, this metaphor is the idea that there's a stream of, you know, fluid flowing by and we humans see it as water. But if you're a hungry ghost or a preta, you see it as pus. And if you're a, a god, a deity, you see it as nectar or ambrosia. So the idea here is not that those are three incorrect interpretations of experience, but rather that the sense, the senses of those different kinds of beings lead to different types of interpretations. Again, it's the way in which, in some sense, that the, the what's flowing by there as water or pus or ambrosia, that what we're seeing is mutually constituted by self and world. So that's a key feature of it being context sensitive. It's sensitive to, you could say, again, the, the desires, the interests, the training, the language, the style of reasoning, even our sense impressions, impressions are sensitive to that. But also they are very contingent upon the nature of our own embodiments. So that's one kind of challenge, I think, to modern science is to really pay attention to the way in which modern science itself also is contingent on human embodiment. It's contingent on the human senses. And we are not, even though some, some styles of, of, of science, especially in the early 20th century, is trying, maybe even claiming that we can transcend those contingencies, uh, Buddhist philosophers and, and Buddhist scientists, if you like, are, are, are going to argue back very strongly that that's actually impossible. One way to think about this is if we could produce a kind of knowledge, a knowledge system that was completely free of any aspects of human cognitive structures, then humans would not be able to understand it. I'm not sure it would be science then anymore. Now, part of what this points to is another issue that Buddhism really, uh, uh, I think, poses a challenge, that Buddhist science poses a challenge for contemporary science, and that is objectivism. I already referred in the, to, uh, the, to the early 20th century, and there were various movements, but positivism is probably the best known, in which philosophers and scientists are trying to establish the, the, the objective nature of scientific knowledge. And Hal, was, Hal Roth was also referring to this. The sense in which, and, and again, as a public process, there's a kind of, you might call objectivism, that probably wouldn't be the right term, but there's a process in that public working uh, 
the public working through of the data and the interpretation of the data, the arguments back and forth, uh, the corrections given by one and the other, right? The sort of intersubjective process of that knowledge system. What's had part of what's happening there is that my own individual beliefs about the interpretation of my experience, for example, that those individual beliefs are being subjected to the beliefs of others. And so in that kind of an intersubjective public process, the conclusion that I come to is not a conclusion that's just mine, actually. It's a conclusion that is, in some sense, shared by that whole community of knowledge. So there's that kind of that is that objectivism. If I if I am saying, well, my own particular subjective first person experience is not going to be the final court of appeal here. That is not going to be that is not going to give me the definitive answer about whatever it is I'm examining, like the nature of consciousness, for example. But rather, it's an interpretation that is being that is constructed that is engaged as a process with an entire community who are in, in some ways probably going to maybe ch make, uh, change my mind. I'm going to uh, have to adjust a little bit uh, my interpretation of what's happening. So that intersubjective process produces a type of knowledge in which the subjective is certainly, how to put it, you might say, almost impeded. Of course, you can't completely eliminate the subjective from the Buddhist standpoint because all of that knowledge is occurring within a particular embodiment. But there is a process that is in, sim in ways similar to uh, um, um, uh, you know, the objectivism of, let's say, the early 20th century of trying to reduce the influence of my own subjective proclivities, my own subjective tastes. In other words, you could say you know, if a scientist in, in India... Uh, is uh, very fond of coffee and a scientist in Britain is very fond of tea, that in principle, those, those differences shouldn't impact their interpretation of, let's say, some fMRI data, right? So that that process of science, the communal process of science, uh, eliminates what you might call irrelevant subjective differences. But that's not the kind of objectivism that uh, uh, Buddhist science is, is going to pose a challenge for. Instead, the objectivism that is, in is challenged and directly critiqued by Buddhist science is, has two aspects to it. The very strong version of objectivism would be the belief in some sense that our cognitive structures, let's say, uh, that our cognitive structures map perfectly onto the structures of the world. And one example of this would be mathematical objects. That, I, that the mathematical objects, as a mathematician, for example, if, as a mathematician is working through a problem in their mind, that the, the mathematical objects that they're working with actually exist in the world as real things outside of the human mind. Now, that type of objectivism is, is uh, heavily critiqued, even by the quite uh, low levels of analysis in Buddhist philosophy. Uh, I'm not going to go into, the, into details there, some of you are probably already aware of those critiques. But instead, I want to move to a slightly subtler level of critique. And this is referring to different levels of analysis that I'm going to be coming back to momentarily. So at a slightly deeper level of analysis, or as the metaphor would be in the Buddhist world, a higher level of analysis, the claim is that there are no categories in the world. There's no such thing. For, for example, a, a simple category might be, you know, simply the category of pen. And so when we say pen, the assumption is that the sort of naive assumption I have is when I use the word pen, that that word somehow refers to these two different entities, right? I think, I assume you guys agree, these are pens. And when I say pen, you know, give me the pen, you don't uh, reach over and give me something else. You just come over and give me the pen, right? So it seems to work and our naive sense is that this is a pen and this is a pen. So there's actually something there that they share that they both have, we could say maybe penness, or that they're both members of the same set or something. There's some way for us to, uh, to establish that there's something the same about these two entities such that we can call each of them a pen. And the intuition is that that sameness, whatever makes them both capable of being called a pen, is something real. It's in the things themselves. But 
The epistemological tradition is going to argue very vigorously against this position. And the claim is that these two things are completely unique. They are not, there's nothing about them that is the same. That seems maybe at first counterintuitive or maybe counterintuitive all the way down, so to speak. The claim is that we construct the sameness for them by means of a causal process. So very simply put, and this is a rather complex theory called the Apoha or ex uh, theory of exclusion, but rather simply put, what this means is that rather than there being something that's identical about these two things, I can ignore the way in which they're different from each other and instead focus on the way in which they can be excluded from other things that don't accomplish my goals. So once again, I form a sameness for them, right? I create a sameness, a penness, or a set of things that we call pens, uh, however we want to conceptualize that process. I create a sameness for them, and that sameness basically consists in me ignoring their differences, or my mind ignoring their differences, and focusing on the way that they can be excluded from other things that don't accomplish the goals that I'm seeking, like writing. Right. So that's a, a very short summary of a complex theory. But I think the key here that all, all we really need to see here is that the, that this is meant to be a way for us to really fully acknowledge the role that our minds play in the construction of the world. And remember that when we talk about uh, the when we talk about the senses, like I'm seeing the world, once again, that sheer sensory data is in some, in some sense kind of completely useless to us. It has to be interpreted for us to make our way in the world. And so that active interpretation involves the creation of these categories. And no, and there are no categories. You know, pens are not a natural kind. But maybe we say, well, what about color? You know, so with, uh, um, this, this color is, you know, the color white, that's obviously a natural kind. And actually color is an excellent example because color doesn't exist out in the world. Color is a product of the interaction between our visual system and that stuff. So natural kinds for Buddhists just do not exist at all for these Buddhists, the ones that His Holiness are pointing to in the construction of Buddhist science. In other words, we are always creating those categories uh, um, both the, the simplest categories and the most complex categories. How do we do that? I described that process briefly, but a key feature of that process is that we do not just do this kind of arbitrarily. We don't count with a lot of the information that's coming into our senses right now. We're just ignoring. Our system is ignoring. It's not relevant to our goals right now. We only pay attention to that information that is goal relevant in some fashion. And that means that the, that the categories that we are constructing are caught up in our goals. Again, the categories that we construct are caught up in, are dependent upon our goals. And in that sense, if we take that idea of having a goal uh, in, in a broader sense, so like you know, the category of pen, I could call this a cylinder, I could call it a black object, I could call it a visual object. Calling it a pen already brings it into a particular kind of context of action in the world where I want to write, for example. Right? So that category is caught up in a particular kind of goal, a particular way of being in the world, of, of, of doing something in the world. And that is the case for all categories. All acts of categorization depend upon a kind of goal structure. And more broadly, what we could say is that our construction of categories depends on our axiology. That's a fancy term, axio axiology. That really just means everything that has to do with values, right? Good, good ethics, aesthetics, you know, what we think is good and bad, what we think is beautiful or ugly, you know, uh, what we think is worth doing or not worth doing. All of these things, that's our kind of broad axiology, right? And that is what is our our construction of categories of concepts is dependent precisely on that on our axiology so what the part of what that means therefore is that science sometimes and this of course has changed uh you know uh, ever since thomas kuhn's famous work um the historian historian of science thomas kuhn uh 
you know, we now recognize that this idea that science is somehow totally value free, that it's just driven by this, you know, pure inquiry into reality, uh, that that's a naive way of thinking about science. There are lots of things that affect the way in which science is done that have that are not at all about, let's say, empiricism. They can be about rivalries between individual scientists. They can be about the funding structure that's, uh, that funds science. They can be about the, um, the racial attitudes of a particular culture. Uh, all kinds of things can affect the way in which science, scientific research is actually performed. So this idea, however, that science is value free, we will still sometimes hear, especially in sort of more public and, and naive context, that in some sense, science is just this pure investigation of the world. But no, this Buddhist uh, um, approach here is offers really points very directly to the way in which science could not be value free because precisely because all of the categories created uh, by uh, by our sciences actually are in some sense caught up in our axiology, in our values, in what we think is worth doing and what we think is worth researching that it's all caught up in that way. Now, I'm not giving a thorough uh, argument in favor of this position. Uh, you can find that in part by examining the work of Dharma Kirti, and perhaps someday I'll manage to write something about this myself. But the main point here is just this idea that the categorization of entities in the world and our act, therefore, of doing science is always going to be dependent and caught up in our particular system of values. Now, that part of what that then means is, well, what kinds of values are actually driving our work? Uh, you know, I love uh, the uh, philosopher Justin H.E. Smith in referring to science, you know, and again, kind of critiquing this naive idea of science says that especially science as we see it now is often basically driven by engineering in the science in the in the service of power let me say that again i kind of mangled it i love this phrase that he that uh, justin h e smith comes up comes up with science is driven by engineering in the service of power so is that what is driving our science is it wealth is it domination of the environment is it uh, a domination of other humans? Uh, is it uh, curiosity? Somehow I doubt that curiosity is sufficient to explain what's going on in science. This has a parallel in the Buddhist world, which is I've said already that you could say the, uh, uh, that all of our, it, when we're perceiving a world, in order to make our way in the world, to engage with that world, we have to conceptualize it. As we conceptualize it, we're always conceptualizing it within a framework of values. What's good and bad? What do I want? What do I not want? What should I get? What should I avoid? What in Sanskrit is called the Heo Badea, or in Tibetan, the Langdor. Those are all are my categories that I'm using to make sense of the world are contingent on all of that axiology and all of that sort of range of values. And on top of it, if those values are based upon what you might say a fundamental error, then clearly I might be in trouble if that error is going to affect the outcome. In the Buddhist world, you could say that the fundamental error that is driving a lot of uh, that, that, that underlies our system of values and that therefore makes our understanding of the world dysfunctional, at least at some level, is what's called ignorance. Of course, there are different levels of ignorance, and I won't go into that for now, but what we can simply say is that the that in a certain way, uh, the, the engine that drives the creation of that conceptual world through which we are interpreting our experience, the engine that is driving the creation of that conceptual world, and therefore, in a sense, in as much as that conceptualization of the world is also in constituting the world of our experience, that engine is ignorance when that world is conception, when we think of that world in terms of the Buddhist notion of samsara, of the wheel of suffering, right? The merry-go-round of suffering. So ignorance, in a sense, is what underlies our dysfunctional apprehension of the world, including what you might call our dysfunctional science. And what would the 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 one of the key aspects of Buddhist uh, a key contribution, if you like, of Buddhist science is, is simply to say, let's pay attention to that. In what way 
are the fundamental values that are driving our science, are the fundamental interests, the, the appetites, the desires that are driving our science, and what way are they actually rooted in something that is confused and dysfunctional? And then on the other hand, what would be another engine? What else could motivate, could drive our, our science? And of course, the Buddhist answer to that is compassion. That a, a science motivated by compassion Science, in a sense, is wisdom, if you like, in the Buddhist world. It's kind of seeing what is what is truly happening, yatha bhuta darshana, seeing things as they truly are. So wi wisdom in that sense is uh, sort of you could have a kind of analysis that's really caught up in ignorance. You can have a kind of analysis that's caught up in something else. But clearly here what we're talking about is not the wisdom that just takes things apart, but rather the compassion that puts them together. So... Buddhist science is proposing, I think, to all of us that the engine of our scientific inquiry, what drives our scientific inquiry, and what uh, it, therefore drives the creation of our mutual world should be compassion. I think that's a wonderful challenge, one that uh, has many sequelae, many outcomes, but I see, unfortunately, that I'm now at the end of my time and if I'm going to have any time for questions, I better stop now. So thank you very much.